Remember, if you were here last week, we read this passage where God says to Isaiah, you know, I'm God. I'm the only God there is, and I can prove that it's me talking because I'll tell you the future before it happens, something nobody can do other than God. He's the only omniscient being in the universe. And then he goes on and gives them all these predictions that are totally far out. And this is one of the best tonight. <clears throat> Daniel is now living under Persian rule. The Babylonians that captured him originally and took him and his friends as prisoners over to Babylon are gone now. And the, he has another vision. The year is 538 B.C. Here's the text. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. Okay, so they just taken over. Cyrus is the real emperor right now. But this guy is a viceroy that's kind of took over the Babylonian uh, province. It's now a province in the Persian Empire. And you can see he was made king over the Chaldeans. <clears throat> in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So here's Daniel. He's got the scrolls out. He's reading scripture. He comes in Jeremiah. It's one of the Old Testament books. Jeremiah was just a bit older than Daniel. The ink's practically still wet on that scroll, but he knows that it's scripture. They knew it immediately when a prophet would write one of these books that that was an inspired text. And in, Daniel, in uh, Jeremiah, he's reading where God, before they were exiled, was saying, you're going to be exiled, you're going to be taken out of your country. This is the passage he's reading right here. I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, declares the Lord. <clears throat> and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants, and against all the surrounding nations. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And so, remember these numbers, because they come up later. And this is really setting the context for this whole discussion. <clears throat> Daniel is probably sitting there. He realizes he was captured in 605. It's now 538. Years go Numbers go down in B.C., up in A.D., right? So 538 is more recent than 605. So he's been there for a long time. He's an old man by now, 75, 80 years old. And really, the way they count years, there may be an additional one or even two more years because they would count any part of a year, just count it as, as a year. And uh, so that could be 68, even 69 years that they've been in exile. And Daniel's sitting there thinking, you know, we're about to get out of here. We're about to get released. And so 70 years right around the corner, he decides to go to God and just totally uh, spends all his time. I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him in prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. I said, Alas, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled, even turned aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servant, the prophets. And so this just goes on. I'm not going to read all of it. But he just goes into this long confession of remembering why they got put into exile in the first place. When we get down to verse 11, he says, Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God. We've sinned against him. So he's reading uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books also, along with Dan, uh, uh, Jeremiah. The passage he's referring to here, it's in the book of Leviticus, chapter 26. God's talking about uh, how he's going to exile the people out of their land if they go into uh, idol worship and all the other things that they were doing. And he says, if in spite of this, you still don't listen to me, but you continue to be hostile toward me, 
I'll scatter you among the nations and will draw up my sword and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. <clears throat> so as Daniel's in Babylon, all the cities in Israel shattered, uh, burned down, their temple torn down. And uh, then he says, uh, Moses writing this says, the land will enjoy its Sabbath years all the time that it lies desolate and you are in the country of your enemies. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. So the land will enjoy its Sabbath years. The word Shabua in Hebrew, plural Shabuim, means Sabbath. But it can be also used for the word for week. Their word for week was a seven. So it's a week of days, but they also had weeks of years, sevens of years, and this is called a sabbatical year. Every seven years, uh, the, the legislation for this is also in Leviticus. I decided I'm, I don't have time to read it tonight, but you can jot these down and read them on your own if you want. In uh, Leviticus 25, it explains the uh, sabbatical year rule. You can farm and till your ground for six years, but the seventh year, you have to leave it fallow. You don't plant that year. So uh, and today we know that this is good agriculture because you're giving uh, nitrogen-fixing plants a chance to enrich your soil. You're not depleting it all the time. It was also an act of faith, though, that God's basically like, I'll take care of you. Yeah, you, this is going to mean income loss for, this, for farmers. They're going to have to save up food during those six years for that seventh year. So it wasn't a very popular law. Never really followed much. And so God's like, okay. I'll uh, let the land have its Sabbath rest for you. How many, how many Sabbath years had they cut and skipped and not done it? Seventy of them. That's why uh, the context for this whole discussion are sabbatical years, sevens of years. That's important in interpreting a text. You always want to follow the context, right? So some translations, well, translations vary in how they take this, but... <clears throat> This explanation for why the 70 years that they're out in, in exile, it's because we have to pay off 70 different sabbatical years, 490 year period that they've ignored this law. Of course, it's not the reason they got, that's not the reason they got exile. They were guilty of much worse than that, including live child sacrifice to these uh, crazy gods like Moloch and uh, savage, temple, temple prostitution. Well, um, that they understood this way is confirmed for us in Second Chronicles. It's another Old Testament book. And we read there, Nebuchadnezzar carried into exile to Babylon, the remnant, and they became servants to him and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests. There it is again. All the time of its desolation, it rested while the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. All the things we just looked at are right there, right? That's how they put it together. This was written shortly after Daniel, uh, Daniel's time. And so back to Daniel. Okay. This curse is the curse where I'm, I'll exile you from your land if you're not going to follow me. And he says, we deserve this. this is what, that's what happened. And uh, as he's praying, the prayer goes on for a number more verses. But to, to save time, I'll let you read that on your own. All of a sudden, uh, an angel is sent by God and speaks to him. The angel Gabriel. And this is what he says. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city. So, okay... It's basically saying, let's try this again, all right? You just blew it for 490 years. We'll give you 490 more, okay? During that time, you've got to complete your mission to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy or like most translations read, the most holy place, probably referring to the temple in, Israel, in uh, Jerusalem. Let's see. To finish transgression, I don't think that's happened yet. 
put an end to sin. I, I know that hasn't happened. To atone for wickedness, I would say as a Christian, they've, that's the part Jesus played right there. The atoning death of Jesus on the cross. They got that part done. Bring in everlasting righteousness. I think that's probably still in the future. And to seal up vision and prophecy, which means to finish the Bible, finish composing and writing and preserving the uh, scripture texts. And, uh, and, and, and to get the temple built, rebuilt and back in service again. For that, you're going to be given seven 77s. It's not a coincidence that he's reading about 77s uh, of sabbatical years, and then we come in and hear 77s again. Okay, he says, now here's how it breaks down. You are to know and discern that from the issuing of, the, of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, comes, will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Okay, that looks a little complicated, but it's really not that bad. Watch the connecting words. From the issuing of a decree to restore Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, comes, there'll be, there will be, Seven sevens, sixty-two sevens. So we can diagram this. From the issuing of a decree to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. That's what we just read. So this is really, uh, uh, we can do the math. Seven times seven would be 49 years. Sixty-two times seven would be 434 years. So we're going to add those together. The first seven is probably separated because that was how long they spent rebuilding the city. And that's why they apparently, that's probably the best guess for why they break it into two pieces like that. But it's clear that they're sequential. And so we have 483 years here. Now, we need to convert their years into our years because we're going to be using our calendar when it comes to uh, studying what happened in what year, they had a different calendar that was sort of, uh, they thought based on a lunar calendar, although it's really not accurate for the moon either, is a couple days less than this, but their, their year was 12 months of 30 days each. 360 days. Not 365 like it should be. But our calendar, the Gregorian calendar, uh, didn't come into use until the 1500s AD. Ancient people didn't know how long the year was. They couldn't hadn't figured that out. Well, so to convert from their 360-day year, we just take our 483 here, multiply it times 360 days, and it comes out to 173,880 days. Then we just divide in the 365. I'm going to leave the leap year off here. It should be 365 and a quarter. Uh, but that actually just makes it even more accurate if you put that out. I'm just trying to keep it simple here. 476 years. That is, that is our number. We got our number. Is going to be from the issuing of a decree on Jerusalem will be, until the Messiah will be 476 years. If we could just date this decree to rebuild Jerusalem... Right now, the Jews are over in, ba in the Persia. Jerusalem is trashed. And um, some people had gone back earlier to rebuild the temple. And there was a couple of decrees that gave some people permission. Cyrus, the uh, Persian emperor, gave permission for some people, including Ezra, the Old Testament uh, author, to go back and rebuild the uh, temple but it didn't say anything about the city. This one needs to be specifically a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And we can also date that. It's, re it's mentioned in several contexts uh, that the Jews get to go back to their land at this time. The biblical account is in Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah is in Persia. And he has a pretty good job. He's the wine taster for the king. He gets to sit around and drink wine all day. Um, the reason they had wine tasters is because they were convinced that people were always trying to poison the king. And so the wine taster was the canary in a coal mine. And he's the sampler to make sure it's fine. 
And uh, so it's kind of funny. It's hard to get life insurance for this job. <laughs> but anyway, uh, in his book, he says, in the month of Nisan, a 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, the king asked me, why does your face look so sad? It's like, yeah. my wine tester looks like he might be getting sick here. <laughs> Not a good sign. <clears throat> and Nehemiah says, I, I answered, why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what do you want? And he's like, if it please the king, may I have letters to the governors of trans-Euphrates so that they'll provide me safe conduct till I arrive in Judah. And uh, please need a letter for Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. And I'll need that for the beams, for the gates, and the temple fortress, and for the city wall, and for a house for myself. So these letters, what are they? They're decrees. By the king, this guy is going to rebuild Jerusalem, including its walls. Give him safe passage, and give him some lumber. It's a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. You can see from, from uh, Nehemiah's own words that Jerusalem still lay in ruins at this time. Oh, well, so they says the king granted these requests. And so uh, you'll have to read the rest of Nehemiah if you want to see where the story goes from there. But notice this decree is dated the, 20, the month of Nisan and the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes, who's he? Uh, well known to secular history. There's an Encyclopedia Britannica, pretty standard text. Artaxerxes I, an Archimedes king of Persia, goes on to tell how he let the, at the bottom that he let the Jews go back and rebuild their temple. Plutarch is an ancient Greek historian, has a uh, lengthy coverage of Artaxerxes I and, and has, enables us to fix the dates here. Or if you want to go to the most authoritative of all sources, <laughs> you could go to Wikipedia, and there it is right there. King of Persia from 465 to 425. There is no debate about this. Everyone agrees. They all know who he is. He's well known to history. Later in this article, uh, Wikipedia goes on. Nehemiah explained to Artaxerxes the plate of the Jewish people that the city of Jerusalem was undefended, and the king sent Nehemiah to, to Jerusalem with letters um, to, to rebuild the temple. So the Wikipedia, which I know none of us would ever even think of contradicting such a source, <laughs> but they are not a Christian source, and they're probably, frankly, pretty, uh, usually pretty hostile to uh, Christianity, but uh, they're accepting the historicity of this account, which is, which is everyone does. There's really no debate on that. So we started his reign in 465. And our decree is dated in the 20th year of his reign. So let's take a minus 465 to signify a BC date. Add 20 to that, and it comes to 444, 445. And we have to take another year because uh, Nisan is in the spring, and the Persians started their year in the fall. So the year 460, 445 starts in Tishri in the fall and goes through till 444 Tishri. This decree was in the month of Nisan, which means it's now in the spring, which we've, that means we've moved from 445 to 444. And we have our number. We got our number. That's what goes right there. So, ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, ooh, you can already start <laughs> sensing those. Uh, okay. This decree came a hundred years after Daniel's time. Daniel's been dead for a hundred years when this happened. Almost a hundred years. And so from 444, 476 years later, I uh, wonder, so what's our number? Let's do the math. So 440, negative 444, add 476 to that, and we get a positive 32. That is an AD date. 32. We're going to add a number year, another year to that because there's no such thing as a zero year. 
Now, this is maybe difficult to uh, explain. Let me just use pictures to do it. This is a, this is a number line, right? Remember that from <laughs> fifth grade math? <clears throat> and over it, we'll superimpose a calendar. On the left, you see that the numbers match, three, two, and one, right? But on the right, they don't match. They're off by a year. That's because unlike a number line, which, ha which you know, has a, a marker for zero and equal spaces, a calendar, the day that 1 BC ended, the next day, 1 AD began. And therefore, you have to add another uh, integer for that missing zero year. And we come out to 33 AD. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> And that is supposed to be the date for the coming of the Messiah. The, the, the Messiah means the anointed one, the chosen one, the, the savior figure that's promised in the Old Testament repeatedly. That's going to rescue the human race and restore the rule of God on earth. And what happened then? Let's go back to, and check, uh, go back to Daniel 9. Keep reading. This is where we, we got this far. Right, to, to, the decree to restore Jerusalem until the Messiah will be the, the seven sevens, the 62 sevens. It will be built again, that is Jerusalem, will be built again with a plaza and a moat, that's defenses, that's the wall, even in times of distress. Then, after the 62 sevens, the Messiah will be cut off. It's a Hebrew idiom, the full idiom is cut off out of the land of the living. You can see that used, for example, in Isaiah 53 of the Messiah there, being cut off out of the land of the living. It's an expression to die. He gets killed, has nothing. The people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So a second destruction, here Jerusalem has been destroyed, it's going to be rebuilt, and then at, around the, after this Messiah figure comes, it's going to be destroyed again. And that happened. In 70 AD, about 40, 37 years after Jesus, uh, in a revolution against Rome, the Romans came in and just wiped out the city of Jerusalem and uh, demolished the temple there. And it's been that. Uh, that, that was the end of that. <clears throat> well, well, so the Messiah is killed. This is giving us the date for the death of the Messiah. 33 AD, <clears throat> that is the consensus date for the crucifixion of Jesus. Let's go back to authority from on high, Wikipedia, <laughs> chronology of Jesus. They used to think that Jesus could have died in 30, but uh, scholarship has shifted now and agree that it's 33, the overwhelming number of scholars that I'm reading. And partly as they explained, the AD 30 date would be based on astronomical calculations because Passover is based on uh, the changing of the moon in the month of Nisan, it's the 14th of Nisan. So uh, we can see where the moon's uh, phases were through astronomical calculations and the AD 30 date really wouldn't work because you'd be having the Last Supper on Monday. Whereas the AD 33 offers a compatible Last Supper on Wednesday, uh, 1st of April in 33, followed by a compatible crucifixion on March 3rd, or on February 3rd, April AD 33. Oh, man! I still remember the first time I heard this at a lecture, and this guy was using a uh, blackboard to uh, do these numbers and stuff. And when he hit that 33, I'm sitting up and I'm like, what, what? <clears throat> yeah, I wanted him to start over again. I, I was drifting, I was zoning out. That is so wild. Oh, man. So we are looking at a passage here, a very ancient passage, that names the year for the coming of... What the History Channel says, and you know the History Channel is not going to make a mistake. <laughs> in their special on the 10 most 
influential humans in history, which was backed by a panel of scholars that voted on it and stuff. Who was number one? Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, he'd have to be in the top handful, no matter how you figure it. The most influential dude that ever lived, put to death in 33, and this guy, centuries earlier, names that date. Man, what a mind-blowing thing this is. Now, could we poke holes in it? What if this passage was actually slid in by Christians to make it seem like Jesus fulfilled them? It's not going to be possible for several reasons. First of all, we have actual fragments of Daniel seven di from seven different copies in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Recently, just within the past uh, few months, they translated another fragment, and it comes from chapter 9, which before this we did not have fragments from chapter 9. Um, uh, these are reliably dated to a, a century before the time of Christ, or even further back. I mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago that Daniel is in the Septuagint, which was tra translated no later than 150 B.C. Most think it was more like 180 B.C. that it was put together. And we have quotations and, and uh, fragments from the Septuagint from before the time of Christ. Of course, you see in the New Testament, Jesus and others referring to Daniel as a prophet, as uh, an author of scripture already. There's really no way that you can move Daniel any further forward than, than liberal and secular scholars do at like 160 B.C. How would a guy in 160 B.C. know the date of the death of the most influential man in history? Well, maybe the decree... Uh, um, 444 for that decree. Uh, there's really no debate on that part. It's clear the Jews returned to Israel at about this time. And um, all historians accept that date. There's really no reason to doubt it. Uh, so you have two time points, 444 and the 476 years, and they're both locked in long before the time of Christ. Oh, could the New Testament authors fake its fulfillment? I knew there would be something like this. So they're writing their books, and they want their man, Jesus, to, to be recognized. They knew about this prophecy, so they just write in, yeah, and have it come out. You know, they have the, that year come out to be 33. Should have known it. Should have, should have. No, it should not. And it's impossible. <laughs> Literally impossible. Here's why. First of all, the authors of the New Testament never tell us what the date was. That's not how we know the date. What they do instead is they give us various chronological markers, like the fact that Jesus was born under Herod the Great. Uh, the fact that when Jesus cleansed the temple... They said, we've been working on this temple for 46 years, and we know when they started work on that temple. They have, when Quirinius was the governor of Syria, all these different references to external, Tiberius was the emperor at this time, forms like a matrix, and it narrows it down to 33 AD. That's how, so we're the ones that give it the date. If they were going to fake the date for Christ, wouldn't they just come out and say it was in this year? They dated things by uh, various honors voted to the emperor. They had a dating system. They never do that. So for them to fake this, they would have to know how scholars in 2,000 years from now are going to do a chronological study on these documents. Oh, give me a break. That is impossible. And... If you want to study how that chron chronology is put together, you can read my paper on it. Or uh, that Wikipedia article is perfectly good. They both reach the same conclusions. 
Here's an interesting point. Even if there, there was no such thing as a New Testament, we would still know that this prediction came true. Because we have statements from outside the Bible, like this one from Tacitus, a Roman historian writing in 100 AD, roughly, on Emperor Nero. And he's writing on the part where, uh, where the um, big fire that burned down like a third of Rome, while Nero played his lyre, then he blamed it on the Christians. It says, uh, Tacitus explains, consequently to get rid of the report that he was the one that actually started the fire, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite, exquisite torture on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty, that's a euphemistic allusion to crucifixion, the extreme penalty, during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus. It's him, Pontius Pilate. And uh, he goes on to say, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked at the moment, again broke out, not only in Judea, the source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tacitus was no pro-Christian writer. He, he believed they deserved to die, definitely, but not with the cruelty that Nero and tortured them with because he says that the populace started feeling sympathetic toward the Christians because of that. Tiberius, Roman emperor, died in 37, so it's got to be before that. Pontius Pilate served as a procurator from 26 until 36 AD. So there it is. You're right in between those dates. Has to be during those dates. And... Uh, yeah, it doesn't have it to the year, but it's got it. I mean, it's, that is not a coincidence. I, I go back to our statement, our thesis, that this passage accurately predicts the date of the death of Jesus over 500 years before the fact. <laughs> One time I was teaching a high school Bible study, and uh, some parents came in. They were suspicious. They wanted to know what we were teaching <clears throat> their kid. They were from the neighborhood there. And uh, I said, well, we teach the Bible and, uh, you know, pretty straightforward stuff. And they were kind of, you know, uh, yeah, the, 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 the dad was a lawyer, young lawyer type in his 30s. He was kind of like, well, yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't believe in, you know, the Bible has any kind of inspiration or value or anything like that. I mean, it's, it's a quaint book, whatever. And I was like, well, if I could show you evidence that the Bible was, is inspired by God, would, that, would you be interested in that? Would that change your view? He kind of stares and he's like, well, yeah, but I don't think there is anything like that. I said, there is. And his wife's like, well, I, I'd like to hear it too. So uh, <laughs> they're like, uh, well, I said it would take about 20 minutes. We spent longer than that here. I went with a short version. And they were like, uh, so when can we do this? Like, How about right now? It's only 8.30. So we walked up the lane to their house. It's up in Westerville. And I said, I'm going to need some paper and a pen. And we get a pad out there, and I have my Bible with me, and I... And so I'm on the floor, and pretty soon they're on the floor too. The three of us on the floor with the Bible here in front of us. And I just drew this right here. And when that conclusion fell, and he, he had gotten up and gotten, went and got a calculator, something that used to exist, these things that... <laughs> he, was, he was doing the math along with, oh yeah, that's, that's it. And they're like, he's like, I never had any idea there was anything like this. I had no idea that there was any proof uh, that, that for the inspiration of the Bible. And they were like, we want our friends to know about this. Can you come back and talk to them? I was like, yeah. So we set it up for a couple weeks later, and I walked in there. There were like 35 people in there. <laughs> and they had a whiteboard on the easel <laughs> ready to go. That was fun. 
My own life was changed by it too because very skeptical. I was exposed to this. I was already technically a Christian, but not really walking with God. I was a big doubter. And this really, uh, I went home and we spent time studying it at our ministry house. And, uh, whoa. So here's a question then. How do we explain this material? There's got to be an explanation. It's there. It's real. The ways that I had thought of poking holes in it don't work out. And I've, I've seen people respond to this, not like that couple did, uh, where they were excited and wanted to know more, but kind of like, well, that's, that's really interesting, quite curious, and just never think about it again. Is that really fair? Are you being intellectually honest with yourself if you do that? Or the bigger question, who's Jesus? He's the, he's the target. He's the focus of this prediction. How many founders of uh, you know, any spiritual tradition, religion, whatever, have something like this to validate them, to back up their claims? None. No one. He's the only one that has this kind of thing behind him, backing him up. Jesus himself said to his followers, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me by Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must all come true. And so this prediction here is one of several hundred predictions about Jesus. Most of them, things that he could not fulfill himself. How do you manage to orchestrate your birth being in Bethlehem? You know, uh, obviously, uh, how, do you, how do you get the Romans to decide to execute you on a, on a specific date? <clears throat> uh, he also said this. My teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he'll find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. So basically, Jesus is making an offer here that's pretty good. Do you want to know if I'm real, if I'm, if I'm truly the Messiah? Then the question is, if I, if I show you that I am the Messiah, if God shows you that, would you be willing to follow? If you're willing to do God's will, then God will show you. Tell, so basically, what you do here is you just tell God, I am willing. Okay, if this is really truth, uh, show me that, and uh, I'll I'll connect the dots. I'll follow down, and I believe that everyone who prays that to God, that He will answer you, and in different ways for different people. But He will show you His presence and uh, His reality in a personal relationship. There it is, right there. So really, I guess what I would a- am asking is why not ask God for the rest of the story tonight? Just tell him, you know, I get the feeling there's something here. God, if you're there, if you're real, I want to know you. I want you to show me the rest of what I can know. And he's going to answer that prayer. Now... This prophecy is sort of complex. And I think the complexity of it actually strengthens the uh, um, extraordinary you know, uh, power that it has. And, but if you want to go back and review how we got that timeline again, we give out a free book to visitors here at the coffee bar. And it's got a chapter on this passage in there. And it's got all those numbers and facts, and especially in the footnotes. So feel free to go get one of those and review this if you want at your leisure. And there you have Daniel chapter 9.